what I want to talk to you guys about this morning is I want to talk to you about the glory of God. But what I understand about the glory of God is that it doesn't matter how well I convey this message. The glory of the Lord and the understanding of his glory is something that has to be caught and can't be talked. I can teach you about it, kind of like I could talk to you about marriage, but all the married people in the room would tell you, you don't know nothing until you've been in. You don't know nothing until you've been in for a couple of years. Come on, that first year sounded really nice. You know, you did your honeymoon thing and you were having a good time. A couple of years into it, it's like, who is this person? And it's like the one on the resume doesn't look like anything that I've seen right now. But so much of who God is, what you believed him to be last year, there should be a greater revelation of who he is this year. If you've been taking time with the Father, it's not that, it's not that like, oh man, I didn't even realize, you know, that he had a wife or something like that. It's not that but you get it like mad doctrine out of it, but it's just, we go from glory unto glory. We go from the revelation of who he is into yet another. It's, that it's not that it's new revelation, but for you, it's the fresh thing that the Holy Spirit is now revealing to you. It's what the angels are seeing as they're surrounding the throne of God. It's not that God has changed. It's just that they have caught yet another glimpse of his glory. At Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 6, chapter, uh, or chapter 6, and I believe it's verse 3, he says, The angels are crying out, Holy, holy, yeah. holy, yeah. it's the Lord God and Almighty. Come on. And it says that the whole earth yeah. is filled, not with his holiness, but with his glory. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Beast. Beast. Today we catch the glory, church. You guys ready to receive this this morning? Okay, you may be seated for just a couple minutes. And as you are sitting down, thank you for the music there, Dad Boss. As you guys are sitting there, oh, dang, we got a hard cut off there. Praise God. That's like whenever you're praying really hard to Jesus and your kid just kicks the door. She's like, Bleesh. ready for some water, mama. Second Corinthians chapter three. I'm going to jump in at verse seven. You're going to go to first Corinthians. Hang a right. If you have gotten a revelation, you've gone too far. If you are looking around in Genesis, you haven't been in church in a while. And it's good that you are here at the gathering this morning. Second Corinthians chapter three. I'm going to talk to you about the glory of the Lord. But the core value that we're leaning into as we've been going through this nine week series is I want to talk to you about integrity. And you say, well, how does that work? And I could do a good Tony Robbins, you know, talk, scream at you, make you clap, do the whole bit, and talk to you about how you need to be who you are in front of people that you are behind closed doors. I could talk to you about letting your yeses be yes and your noes be noes. If I can throw myself under the bus for a second, I have told Fabrice that I've come into the small group for the last two weeks and there's been something that's come up every single time. Brother, I'm going to get over there, I promise. <laughs> Before God and everybody, I'm going to get over there. Letting your yes be yes, yes. Being consistent in front and behind closed doors. Integrity, that's good. But I want to talk to you about, can I spend this a little bit and talk to you about structural integrity? Can I talk to you about your ability to carry the weight of God's glory? A little bit something different here. The word that we read about in, and when the New Testament talks about the glory of the Lord, it's a Greek word that says kambat. It is literally translated weight. And so when I talk about structural integrity that enables you to carry the weight of God's glory, you're probably less worried about some of those other words. And now you're leaning into what is the glory of the Lord? And I got to be honest, I'd probably read commentaries, videos, all kinds of different things, trying to get the most concise way to describe to you what the glory of the Lord is. But see, the thing about the glory of the Lord, it's not like when you're describing God's glory, it's not like describing a basketball. If I wanted to describe a basketball to you, I could tell you, well, it's, you know, it's about this big and it's orange normally. And when you drop it on the ground, it bounces. And I could give you some things that you could walk into a room and you would say, there's a basketball. Even if you had never seen it before, Tyler did a good enough description. But describing his glory is almost along the same lines of trying to describe beauty. Because what you think is beautiful, might be repulsive to that guy over there, and vice versa, right? It's something a little bit different, but the glory of the Lord, it is his, if I could say it this way, it's his character and his nature, but catch this, it is that which has been revealed throughout. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just who he is, but it's the revelation of who he is that inspires the response. You say, what on earth was it you guys, that you guys did for the first 30 to 35 minutes of this service? We were responding 
to the revelation of who God is. And as you respond to that, the glory of the Lord rests upon this place. Now, it's one thing to understand. The other thing you need to understand is this. You were designed. You say, I'm new to the faith. Welcome to the jury. You were designed to carry the glory of God. Yeah. Do you believe that? You were designed to carry it. So it's not enough just to know that God is patient. It's not enough to understand that he is love. It's not enough to just understand his peace. Robert, it is our job now to carry that weight. And you feel the weight of that responsibility. That Tyler would operate this way, but because I now have the glory of the Lord resting upon me, there's a weight of the responsibility. And the word says that the yoke is easy and the burden is light, but that's only because now I have Holy Spirit working in me and through me to carry that glory. The benefits of this glory are immense. If I could turn your attention just really quick, don't lose 2 Corinthians, but if you look over at 2 Samuel chapter 6, there's a story where David is carrying the Ark of the Covenant. This was a physical object in the Old Testament that was representing the glory of the Father, if I could say it that way, and they're carrying it, but they're not carrying it the way that they were told to carry it. God said it was supposed to be done a specific way. It was supposed to be done on the shoulders of men because even in the Old Testament, the glory of the Lord was to rest upon individuals. But David said, no, we will put it on the backs of the animals. And so the ark starts to tip and a man tries to touch the ark in the process and he dies instantaneously. David gets frustrated and so he puts the glory into the house of a man called Obedito. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel, it says that for three months, uh, Obed-Edom and his family were richly blessed just because they knew how to honor and house the glory of the Lord. That was in that man's house. Now I look across this room and everywhere you go, I see people who are now carriers of the glory of the Lord. The question is, are you experiencing the blessing that comes in line with that? If you say, oh, I haven't seen that pastor, you might not be carrying it the right way. I want to talk to you about how to carry the weight of his glory through the integrity of your life. I feel like sometimes we're like children and that we see someone, like I'll look over at Vincent and say, man, he's got some of the things that I want in his life and God just keeps on blessing him. He must love him more than he loves me. But what I want to suggest to you this morning, it's, it's certainly not that God loves one more than the other because his love is without measure. You understand that he loves you as much today as he'll love you 20 years from now. He'll love you if you go to Africa and he'll love you the same if you don't. His love is without measure. It's not only best. But could I suggest that possibly the reason why there are those of us who are walking in a greater measure of blessing is because they have learned how to engage and to carry the glory of the Lord at a greater measure. I want to tell you, it comes at a cost, but it's worth every penny. It's worth every tear. It's worth every prayer. It's worth every moment of waiting. David says, Psalms 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handy work. If I could just simplify the entire message down and only get one thing today, what I want you to understand is that if you want to increase your capacity, if you want to increase your structural integrity, integrity so that you can carry a greater measure of his glory, then you have to find out how you personally connect with God. And you probably don't connect with God the same way the person sitting next to you connects with him. That's why we've been showing you guys videos. David says that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. I want to show you a video real quick of some guys that have learned to connect with God through nature. I feel like as soon as I step out doors, I hear the Lord say, come away with me. It feels right. Yeah. It feels, yeah. This is what I was, this is what I was made for. Yeah. I connect with God inside too, but outside, in creation, in nature, outdoors, it's just so easy to get in his presence. And like the things that like I naturally enjoy, the Lord also delights in it supernaturally. The first time uh, I ever encountered the Lord outside of church was on a river on a fly fishing trip. I encountered the love of God in a way that I never thought was even possible. And I just would continually just go out there every time I went fishing, hunting, hiking. If that was my time, not just to go do things I like, but that was my time to spend time with the Lord. I even found deliverance in outside in creation where 
I struggled with suicide and depression uh, pretty severely. I would go outside and I had so many moments of deliverance um, where I found freedom because I connected with God most in those, in those moments of creation. Whenever I was a kid, there was something that was just a little bit weird about me. I would, I would see somebody's uh, yard that was really nice. And so I would tell my parents, like, that's nice grass. And they're like, you're weird. And, <laughs> um, I would tell my parents, whenever I have a house, I'm going to have no weeds in my yard. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be green. And I'm going to take care of my grass. And then one day I felt like God was calling me outside to, to go pray. And this was, now I have a nice yard and green grass and no weeds. And I went and sat down in the grass and I took my shoes off. I you know, took my socks off and I sat down in the grass, you know, and it's like all in that moment, God told me the desire that you have in your heart didn't come from you as a kid. You didn't just love being outdoors. You didn't just look at somebody's, somebody's grass and find it, you know, beautiful for no reason. I, I place that inside of your heart for this moment right now. I feel like I've, I've grown so much more just because I've simply started praying outside yeah. and talking to God outside. How I would articulate it is like a little kid looking at Picasso. It's just marvel. And, it, and there's worship in a worship setting that you can sit there and sing the same song, but it's different when you can look at a mountain or a sunset or the stars and you just, like, you just look at it. Like, okay, you didn't get the job. He made the mountains. He controls the sea. He appoints people in authority. Like, it makes you realize how tiny you are. It's just, like, I want to sit there and marvel at what my dad did. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to go touch some grass. <laughs> go touch some grass. Go hug a tree. <laughs> Jesus, help us. All right, one more time. Would you guys stay with me? Hopefully by now you found 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If not, I got your mat today. We got it on the screens. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, what Paul's going to be comparing here, he's going to say the old way. He's going to be talking about the old covenant. He's going to be talking about the way that God would relate with his creation through 613 laws, through a dynamic where every time they would drop the ball, there was sacrifices that had to be made. There was disconnect that had to occur uh, throughout their community just as a result of sin. And yet, Paul says, the glory of the Lord still rested upon those who were seeking after him. That's actually going to make note of a real historical figure. This is not Frodo on the Mount of Mordor. He is actually a man who has ascended the hill of the Lord, and he is connected with God face to face. And what the word says is that Moses would dwell in the glory of the Father for so long that his face would literally shine, and they would have to put a veil over his face to but the glory would fade. And now Paul says we have such a greater covenant. There was one whose face would shine and the glory would fade and he'd have to go reconnect. And now in this new covenant, the glory does not just rest around us, but it dwells within us. And now we are carriers of that presence. Now this is what Paul says, verse seven here, Second Corinthians chapter three, verse seven. He says the old way, with laws etched in stone, led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Now here we are, verse 8. He says, shouldn't we expect a far greater glory under this new way? He's talking about this new covenant, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life. Oh, <laughs> If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, the first glory was not really glorious at all in comparison to the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever 
in the hearts and lives of those here at the gathering here in Prosper, Texas. Amen. Come on, somebody. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time together. I thank you that no one has come to hear me, God. We've all come to hear you. And so we invite you now, Holy Spirit, to come and speak to us. Illuminate this word to us, Lord God. Reveal your heart to us, Lord God, and show us where we find ourselves in you so that we may walk in boldness, strength, and authority in accordance to your word. We ask, can we place a demand on your presence today? We say, speak, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now you guys can send down. If you need to stand up and clap every now and then, we'll let you do that. If you get too wild, Willie Dennis is going to tackle. Come to tell you this morning that you were designed to carry the glory of the Lord. I want you to understand that God's glory carries weight. And you were not designed to carry that weight all by yourself, that it is to be carried in conjunction with the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so our prayer this morning is, would you increase our ability to carry a greater measure of your glory? Anybody want to be bold enough to look at your neighbor and say, you look like you're carrying a little extra weight this morning? <laughs> and it looks good on you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're carrying a little, just a little bit, man. Just a little extra. See, look at there. Low card for a month, and I already got the fat jokes, Vincent. No, you're down. He said, I can't tell nothing, Pastor. That's all right. It's the jacket. It makes me look fluffy. So you're asking, what's Jenga about? Let's just say, hypothetically, and this little box here is representation of the way that God originally designed you to be to carry the weight of the glory. I would not do it because I like the way my ankles function, but I'm pretty confident that I could stand on top of this structure and it would be able to hold my weight as it was designed. If this is our lives and this is how we were designed to carry the weight of the glory for Acts chapter 7, verse 48, it says, by Paul, he says, it was not meant, the Most High was not meant to dwell in houses made by hands. This was a major stab at the children of Israel because they were proud of the structures that they had built. Moses' tabernacle, it was mobile, but it was beautiful. God was very specific about the materials and the way that it was being built. We move on to King Solomon. It was said by one that, I read a couple commentaries actually, where they think that maybe half of the gold that was present in the known world was used to create that temple. It was a beautiful thing. And yet Paul looks at that and says, don't try to go back to that place. You are now created to carry. First Corinthians 3, 16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? And now the question, has you ever tried playing Jenga while you talk? That's fun. Question is though, how's the structural integrity of the temple? See, in the beginning, my temple looked nice. My temple looked like something that could hold some weight. I believe that God is wanting to increase in a greater measure his activity and the revelation of who he is in your life. But so be that is, you don't quite have the integrity of your life put together in such a way that if God wanted to bless you right now, that blessing would become a curse in a matter of months, weeks, maybe on the day of. You see this with people, I'm not trying to say that God blesses people through the lottery, but how many times do you hear about people that all of a sudden go from trailer park to, you know, hundred million dollars or more, and then all of a sudden they can't even afford the trailer no more within a month. Because the structural integrity of their life was not designed to carry such a rich gift. And how many know that we have a good father? That although we can do things that will put us in positions that God never intended us to be in, and he will use those things for his glory, but he will never intentionally bless you with something just to crush you. He'll move you to a place where you need him more, but as your integrity begins to get a little shaky, you fall. It was just because God wanted to pour out something more for your life. Just wonder, how's your integrity doing today? If God wanted to bless you exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think, how is the integrity in your life? Would you be able to hold the immense calling and purpose that he has for you today? To be sure, none of us are ready for what God has for us in five years. But today, give us this day, our daily God, give us the strength, give us the resources, give us the relationships that we need through this thing so that I may be strong enough to carry the weight of your glory. David says in Psalms chapter one, verses one through three, and I'm gonna hang here for a while. He says that the blessed man is like the one who is a tree planted beside a stream of water 
and that it yields fruit in its season. And so my question for you this morning is what season of life are you in? I'm not asking if you're in the married season, the hope to be married season, the wish I wasn't married season. Let me show you three seasons. You have a sowing season. You have a waiting season. You have the season of harvest, and then you have a season of stewardship. You sow, you wait, you harvest, and then you steward. And then you know what you do whenever you're done stewarding? You sow, you wait, you harvest, and then you steward. And then you say, I've done it twice now. What do I do next, Pastor? You sow, you wait, you harvest, and then you steward. I've been walking with the Lord now for 30 years. What do I do next? You sow, you wait, and you harvest, and you steward. Can I help you identify what season of life you're in? Because you might want to be in the harvest season, but God's still waiting for you to do the sowing. You may have sowed all that you need to sow in that, in that season, and he wants you in the waiting season, but you're still striving, trying to create the results on your own. What season are you in? I'm talking to you about the sowing season. This is the season where you are dying to yourself. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 30, he says, he must, de- he must increase and I must decrease. God must increase, therefore I must decrease. When we talk about the structural integrity of your life that is going to enable you to carry the weight of the glory of the Lord. Church, it's time to grow up. We need to move past the let my yeses be yes and my noes be noes. That's good. We need to hold on to that. Being true, be real, be honest, like what you see in front of me here, I want you to be behind closed doors, yes, but I'm telling you, there's a greater measure of sowing that you begin to get before your fa- heavenly father, and he begins to speak to you, and he says, I just, I want that hobby. You say, but Vincent does that hobby, and we live in the same house. You don't, you don't ask, don't worry about Vincent, I, I want that thing. It's a sowing season, and you could go give five other things in that season, but he says, I'm still waiting for the one. One of the pitfalls of this sowing season is that we're looking for results in the moment. How foolish would it be for a farmer to throw a seed in the ground and be like, it hasn't grown yet. It hasn't grown yet. I just don't want to do that anymore. I'm all done. It's like, brother, you haven't even gone through the waiting season. You're still in the sowing season. There is a discernment to know when is it that enough is enough. I'll tell you when enough is enough. When you have given him exactly what he desires, nothing more nothing less, just so. There's a propensity sometimes in the lives of people to keep on taking, especially if you love fasting. It's like, maybe I can manipulate God if I do enough. And so I threw the seed, nothing. Let me throw another one. Nothing. Still wait. He said, all I wanted was the first one. Yep, look at all these things. I got plenty. What do you want me to get? I'll give you another one. What else do you need, God? The sowing season is about Dying to oneself. Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. For sure, start with the sin, but then let's migrate to a place of saying, God, what else is it that you want? Could we be a people here at the gathering that pray like David prayed in Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24, where he prays out, Search me, O God. Somebody needs to write this down because you need to pray this tonight. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Don't let me ask him if I've done anything to offend somebody. That's like my favorite pastime. (laughs) Just walking in the room sometime, I feel like I take somebody off. He says, just anything, Lord God, search me, search me. I want to feel like I'm self-aware, but I recognize that there's blinders in my life and there's probably some things that I could let go of. And maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's not something that's trying to send me right into the center part of hell, but maybe it is something that's placed a barrier between me and God. Maybe it is a hobby. Maybe it is a drinking habit. You say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about drinking alcohol being wrong. I just can't get drunk past it. That's fine. But what if it was just the season of sowing to say, hey, God, there's that booze and I trust you. Maybe I've learned how to cope with stress, not by getting like sloppy drunk and sending goofy text messages to everybody in the church, but I just have to kind of get the edge. Come on, you know you sense of good. I see that. <laughs> Don't look at her. <laughs> Maybe I just need to kind of round the edge off. 
There's nothing wrong with that, right, Pastor? I'm not even going to fight with you about it. But if it's the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about making sacrifice, can you just sow that seed and let it go? First season right there, the sowing season. Not looking for results, just obedience. Next season follows right up after that. This is the waiting season. If I can be honest with you guys, I believe that this is where the gathering's been for the last few months, that we have been in a season of sowing. We've been in a season where we say, hey, we, you know, we've had some hard Sundays, literally having the, the wheels fall off of the trailer sometimes, people calling in sick last minute, all kinds of stuff. We've had the sowing season, and it's not that that season will never come back around again, but I believe that we are now in a holy moment of waiting before the Lord. And you might say, but I don't like to wait, and I feel you on that. My ADD is like... <laughs> I feel you. I know. It's the struggle is real. But this is the season where you get to build history with God. It's in the waiting season. Man. It's in the waiting season that you start building history with God. Let me give you a scripture verse to lean on with this. Isaiah 40, verse 31. He says this. He says, they that wait upon the Lord. Some of you guys already know this. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles, and they will run and not be weary. They will walk and not Saint, this is a spiritual season where church and the waiting is where you need to get into the word like you've never gotten into the word before. It's in the waiting that you need to find the way that you connect with God, whether it's your tiptoeing through the tulips out there or whether you're doing it through movement in another way or whether you're the studier, whether you're the reformist, whatever it is, there's so many different ways that you can connect with God, but it is so vitally important that in 2024, if this is going to be a year of the supernatural for your life, you have to learn how to connect with God. It is through the connection with the Father that we learn how to carry the weight of his glory. It's in the waiting season, Isaiah says, that we are strengthened. You might need to look at your neighbor and say, you're looking a little tired. <laughs> say, you already called me fat. I'll call me tired too. <laughs> it's in the waiting season that he says, it's in the waiting that you're strict on it. It's in the waiting that you're renewed. You're so excited about the harvest season, but I'm just trying to get you right now in the waiting season because you don't even have an idea of the sprint that we're about to go on in the harvest season. You need to learn to rest. We're going to talk about Sabbath as a core value here in a couple weeks. It was a holy thing. It wasn't a suggestion. It was right there in the midst of all creation. Father rested. They that wait upon the Lord have their strength renewed. They that wait upon the Lord mount up on wings like eagles. Some of you don't need a situation change. You just need a perspective change. You've been so fixated on that negative garbage that you keep spewing out of your mouth that you need to just shut up for a little while and learn how to wait upon the Lord. So we don't say shut up in church, Pastor. It gets worse, don't I? It says they mount up on wings like eagles and then they run and they don't get weary. Church, there's going to be a season in the near future where we start running. And if you didn't take the time to sow the heavy things and so easily entangle and hold you down, if you haven't taken the time to rest up and get ready for the sprint that is at hand. A life is a marathon, but the harvest season, I'm trying not to get too far ahead of myself here, but the harvest season is often, it's these, it's these sprints. You have to have that waiting season so that you can run and not grow weary and you walk and you do the faint. There's so much more that is to be revealed. And it's revealed in the waiting. When Jesus speaks to the disciples as he's about to ascend unto heaven, he tells them that they have to go to Jerusalem and wait. They're waiting for something. He, he says in another part, he says, I have a lot more to tell you, but you're not ready to hear it yet. I just need you to wait a little while. Are you willing to wait upon the Lord? If I could just give you one pitfall in the waiting season, a lot of us, we spend too much time focusing on strategy. We get too fixated on, this is what God's going to do. This is the girl God asked for me. This is the guy God asked for me. This is the job that I'm going to do. And so I'm going to do everything to build up in the season. Instead of focusing on strategy for a while, could I encourage you to focus on your health? So that whatever comes, I'm ready to move at a moment's notice. The problem with losing the art of waiting is that you're constantly running like a maniac and all of a sudden the door opens there and you're like, oh my goodness, and it's like, I missed it. My dad and I, we get talking, we start driving. I miss the turn on a regular basis because I get so fixated on where I'm going. I'm just enjoying the conversation. I'm not even paying attention. That's so many of us. We just, we're talking, we're moving, and God's like, door's over there, brother. And the waiting, it's so easy to pivot 
in the running, it's like, I got to catch my breath for a second. I got to slow down. I got to tap the brakes. But if I learn how to wait, the doors that are opened by the Father will easily walk into. So focus on your, your help before you focus on a strategy. Focus on learning how to hear the voice in the Father so that whatever it is that comes your way, you say, I'm ready to go. I know exactly what God's saying in this moment. I'll get to the fun one here. This is the harvest season. That's number three. This is where you get to take hold of the moment. This is something that I've learned from my dad. There's something about walking into a room and recognizing that you were created for this season. Right? I mean, like, you can try to study, you can try to plan, you can try to do everything else, and there's nothing wrong with that, but this can't be strategized away. You just have to be spiritually healthy and ready to go so that at a moment's notice, you say, I know what to do right here. I know, I know what God's saying right now. I know how to handle this season of harvest. Peter did this in Acts chapter 2, right? So Jesus tells the disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait. So they're waiting. Holy Spirit comes. They begin to prophesy in tongues. 3,000 people get saved. And Peter's the one that stands up in Acts chapter 2, verse 16. And he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that season of the glory of the Lord where you say, this is what I've been praying about. This is what I've been waiting for. Guys, I got this. Let's go for Jesus. And you know, it's not, a, it's not like a pride thing. It's just that this is what he has prepared me for, for such a time as this. The integrity of my life has been developed and I have been made for this moment to lead in and take hold of the harvest season that God has for you. What I want to tell you in this season, you just keep going right where you are. You don't say tomorrow is going to be the day. No, don't let that seed sit in the ground any longer. It's time to take hold of that which God has given you. You just start right where you are and you look for the opportunity and you get busy. Jonathan does this. This is one of my favorite stories. Second Samuel uh, chapter 14, right? So Israel is taking territory. So they understand they have waited for 40 years. They are entering into the promised land and they know that this Philistine trash keeps on getting in their way and they're in a precarious position. And so they are going around and they see the army ahead of them. It's just a small encampment, but it's just David and his arm or Jonathan and his arm bearer. And he says, we got the covenant that we have. It. We know his power. We've been filmed for this victory and you don't even see him coming. They get up over the hill. You've heard him use this before. Jonathan says, this be he says, perhaps oh, that we would be a church that moves on the perhaps. I know who I am and I know who God has called me to be. I know his power, his strength, and his glory is revealed in me and through me. And so, Perhaps, he says, the Lord will act on our behalf. And then look at the spade. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us, whether by many or by few. I feel like Jonathan's looking at his armor bearer and saying, look, they're in, our, they're in our territory. I know we don't have the weapons and we sure don't have the numbers. But if God's on our side of this thing, nobody's going to stand against us. And you know what? If we miss it, this is what grace is all about, church. If we miss it, we say, who pull us out? He says, it doesn't matter. The Lord will save us, whether by many or by few. It doesn't matter the weapons. It doesn't matter the opposition. It doesn't matter what the interest rates are. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what the boss of the time seems to allow. When I'm standing out in faith in the harvest season, I'm willing to move just on a perhaps because I am that confident in what God has called me to do. But you don't get that confidence if you haven't spent time at the lead. You don't understand that confidence if you haven't taken time to sow and to sacrifice and to lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, trust in him so that he can direct your path. You don't get that until you've taken that time. But then when the harvest season comes, you say, at a moment's notice, let's move. The pitfalls in this season are fear and doubt. When there is fear and doubt, I'm telling you what, just run right towards it like a crazy person. I just get after it. Whenever I, whenever I feel the Lord say, this is something I want you to do. Now, if it's a little off the wall, I'll check with some of my apostolic overseers. But if I know what the word says about this, if I know this is in line with what he's called me to do, and I feel that fear well up, fear's got to go. Holy Spirit's going to have to come up. And that moment, we're going to place a demand on his presence and step out and do whatever it is that he's called us to do. Don't let fear hold you back. But also, let me show you another side here. Don't let momentum cause you to get fat and lazy. Some of you guys have been pushing hard for a spouse. And now you got this beautiful woman right next to you there. 
and you want to just kind of sit back and you already start getting the dad bod, you don't even have a kid yet. You've already stopped the romance. Come on, you've gotten the business and it's already started succeeding and you don't realize that business is not just so that you can retire early and enjoy the new Tesla cyber truck. It's actually generational wealth and it's kingdom wealth that God is positioning you, not just so that you are blessed and highly favored and that your family is well taken care of, because that is part of the call as men and women of faith over our households. We want to bless our families. Don't let your children starve while you go out there and reach the nations. Make sure you take care of the home front first. But then there's generational blessing. There's generational wealth. Your grandchildren should be talking about grandpa's faith and what he did to pave the way so that the glory of the former house will be greater than the glory of the latter house. I thought that would ride there. <laughs> you got to know how to run with it in the harvest season. You guys got capacity for one Lord. It's a season of stewardship. It's the season where now I have Receive the harvest. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? You just going to eat it? Are you going to say, hey, I really want Kyle to be my friend. And so maybe if I throw him some stuff, that he'll be my friend and he'll treat me right. Hey, that guy over there, he seems like he's a cool guy. He's got some money. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll throw some seed his way and he'll pay me some attention. Or you will you be strategic in the gifts, the talents, and the resources that you have to sow them? Because remember, when you get into the sewer eating season, what you're going to eventually get back to right back to the sowing season. And now you're not just sowing the hardships of life, but you're actually beginning to throw out the blessings, the talents, the rewards, and all the things that God has placed in you, not for you to hold, hold on to, but to share with the world around you, to go and live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus. Because you are carriers of the glory. Church, you're carriers of his glory. You come here on Sunday morning, not just so you can get fat and happy and feel like, okay, I did the church thing on Sunday. You come in here with the marching orders to go out and to live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus. You get your little scenes and you say, I'm ready to go. I haven't gotten to do some ministry at McDonald's in a hot minute. I feel like those people are leaving. <laughs> Don't leave me astray. That cashier needs to hear about Jesus. Come on, Jose. That guy over there at Home Depot, he needs a prophetic word, doesn't he? Come on. That family member that we don't talk except on Thanksgiving, she needs a text message. He'll let you know, hey, I just, I was praying for you. I was thinking about you. God has great plans in store for you. Don't give up yet, honey. I got you. Come on, your spouse that you've been bad-mouthing every night, you guys can't even hardly sleep in the same bed. It's time that that woman gets a hug and you apologize. It's time to sow a seed and look like Jesus. Forgive like Jesus. You say, I can't do that on my own. That's okay. You are a carrier of the glory of the Lord. It is resting upon you, and he is ready to richly bless you, not for your benefit first and foremost, but for the benefit of those around. Jabez prayed like this, and I'm going to close it out with this. Help me out, man. He said, he cried out to the God of Israel. He said, oh, Lord, would you bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. It said that God granted his request. Oh, Lord, that you would rest your glory upon this house, Lord God. And I stand here before great men, stand here before Dave Bacher, who has given his life to you, Lord God, for decades. I stand here before Dale Everett, who has led untold thousands, tens of thousands of people unto you, Lord God. And yet I still hold fast to the words of Haggai in chapter 2 that says that the glory of the present house shall be greater than the glory that was there in the former house. I don't understand it because these men that I just lifted off right there, that would be enough if I could just get to that point. But that's not the biblical precedent. Come on, can you stay with me? Because I'm, I'm telling you, you need to lead in on this right now. This is the plan. You might have had some examples. You might have had some spiritual leaders in your life and you said those men were really great. But understand the seeds that you're throwing down right now are with the expectations that the glory that is in this present house will be greater 
greater than the glory of the former house. Yeah. You guys get to be a part of this. Come on, the thousands of people that we've seen filled with the Holy Spirit, the untold tens of thousands of people that we've seen supernaturally healed, that glory was great in the former day, but this present house shall see a greater move of the Holy Spirit. Come on, Nico, your dad knew how to pray, he knew how to intercede. You're gonna touch heaven like he's never even imagined touching heaven. We're going in deeper, guys. I don't know all your family history, but regardless, either you say, as for me and my house, we're gonna start praising the Lord because mom and dad had nothing to do with you. Whatever it is, the glory of this house right here today is uniquely designed to rest, to wait, to harvest and to steward a supernatural blessing from the Lord that will be so much greater than anything our forefathers have ever seen. God, we're calling out for revival here. I need somebody to help me, intercessors. I'm calling out for revival here over Prosper, over Salina, over Aubrey, come on, over McKinney and over at Islands. I pray that you'll keep them calm and that your will be done, Lord God. I pray that there are men and women within this house that will take up a mantle and say, I'm ready to sow a seed that's gonna go beyond on my life that's going to reach the generations to come. I'm willing to pour it all that I have in me, empty it out like a tray thought drink. Stand over you, Lord God, because I'm hungry. I know of you because I want to see your glory come and rest in this place, Lord God. You were not designed to live in buildings, but you called us to come and be a place where your glory can dwell. Would you allow us to be carriers of your presence, Lord God? Everywhere they go, Change the way they speak, change the way they move, change the authority, change the boldness, Lord. Hey. More. Jesus, more. Well, more of you, Lord God. Come on, you guys hungry fast. Well, you, I feel it. There is a change in the atmosphere, Lord God. This is a year of the supernatural. Um, give it up. 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 Give it